Hello everyone, and welcome back to the History of Africa podcast. I'm your host, Andy. Last episode, after his predecessor was impeached, Osei Kwajo radically reformed the Ashanti domestic government. These reforms included the creation of two new parliamentary bodies, one to represent the Insafohene and Amanhene in government, as well as a lower house to represent, theoretically, the interests of the empire's common subjects. Additionally, new bureaucratic positions were created to take away the responsibilities of running various departments of government from the traditional kings of the Kotoko Council, and bureaucrats were increasingly appointed by merit, rather than family connections alone. This episode, we'll learn about Osei Kwajo's foreign policy, where he proved equally willing to shake up the status quo. Season 3, Episode 10, The Abora Crisis. So, let's quickly recap where exactly the status quo of Ashanti foreign policy was at when Kwajo was elected to the Golden Stool. In summary, foreign policy was a complete mess. During the civil war between Dako and Obadom, the southern states of Chwifel, Wasa, and Achim had gone into revolt against the preoccupied Ashanti military, achieving de facto independence from their former overlords. These southern kingdoms attempted to band together into a coalition with the Fonti to counter future Ashanti attempts at reconquest and block Ashanti access to coastal trade. However, the coalition struggled in this task from the very beginning. The Wasa kingdom provoked disunity through raids into Fonti lands, which weakened the alliance's solidarity immensely. The Ashanti used this disunity as an opportunity to successfully re-establish some control over the Achim, but struggled in part due to the support of the rising Daume empires for the Achim rebels. And, yeah, we all remember the disaster that unfolded when the Ashanti tried to mount a punitive expedition against the Daume. Now, the failure of the Ashanti army in its invasion of Daume clearly had to have had a pretty big impact on Kwajo and his advisors. Remember, this military defeat had been the final straw that led his predecessor to being ousted from power. So, with that in mind, would it surprise you to hear that Kwajo's administration, which had come to power in the first place off the back of their own predecessor's failures, would prove to be a little bit cautious in terms of foreign policy? While the Ashanti government would continue to make use of force of arms throughout Kwajo's reign, it's pretty evident from the very beginning that Kwajo was a bit more reserved in his foreign policy. Rather, throughout his reign, Kwajo would employ a new model of foreign policy, one which relied much more on diplomatic maneuvering and the flexing of economic might rather than men with muskets and swords. In modern political terms, Kwajo was more of a soft power guy than a hard power guy. So, for those of you not familiar with the concepts, let's talk a little bit about soft and hard power, briefly, because this isn't a political science podcast. Used by foreign policy and international relations theorists, soft and hard power describe two different ways through which countries will exert their influence over others. Hard power describes the coercive, aggressive means of getting other countries to do what you want, primarily through the use of threats of force. The term hard power brings to mind images of militarism, and that is understandable. After all, hard power is all about threats and force, and what's more threatening and forceful than the use of the military? However, while most uses of the military are examples of hard power, not all hard power is inherently militaristic in nature. For example, I can threaten a country economically by threatening to impose sanctions or enact an embargo. So while hard power relies on threats, soft power does the opposite. Instead of requiring a country to impose its will on another through threats and force, soft power allows a country to bring other countries under its influence through persuasion and co-option, whether through diplomacy, friendly economic ties, or cultural influence. As political scientist Joseph Nye put it, hard power twists arms, while soft power twists minds. Now, I want to make it clear that these concepts of soft and hard power are not a strict dichotomy. That is to say, it's not black and white. Oftentimes, as we'll see throughout this show, a certain diplomatic action can blur the lines between soft and hard power, or a country can use soft power to advance its capability for hard power or vice versa. For example, let's remember a couple episodes back. During the reign of Apokuware, the Ashanti Hene sought to reignite the fading alliance between the Ashanti Empire and the Akumu to their east. Remember how he reignited this alliance? By exploiting an Akumu succession dispute and providing arms and money to one side of the conflict to help that side win. When the Ashanti supported faction won the war, Opokuware's support during the conflict secured an alliance with the winner. Is this interaction an example of soft or hard power? Well, it's kinda hard to say. I'm personally leaning in the direction of soft power, because Opokuware didn't exactly threaten the Akumu into reigniting the alliance. However, I could see this being an example of hard power as well. I mean, while the Ashanti-aligned faction was not coerced or forced into an alliance, you could essentially argue that Opokuware used the Ashanti-aligned faction as a proxy to force an alliance with the Akumu as a whole. However, apart from this one example, there is very little ambiguity in Ashanti policy before Osei Kwajo's reign. Overwhelmingly, Ashanti foreign policy throughout her season has made use of hard power, 
The wars against Chuifo, Bono, Achim, Daume, and others are all very clear examples of this. I mean, the Ashanti didn't bother to try to win hearts and minds in these conflicts, it was arm-twisting all the way. And for the most part, it's worked out pretty well for them. I mean, this strategy did build them an empire, after all. But given the recent circumstances at the time, I think we can see pretty easily why Osei Kwajo would be a little bit apprehensive about the application of hard power. He was no peacenik. As we'll see, he was definitely willing to send in the troops when advantageous. But Osei Kwajo would prove unprecedented among Ashante Hene in his successful application of soft power. Remember, Osei Kwajo came to power in 1764. By this time, the successful campaigns of Opokuware and Osei Tutu were distant memories. At Takpame, the crushing defeat of Ashanti soldiers at the hands of the Daume and Oyo, on the other hand, were still fresh in everyone's mind, including Kwajo's. So, to Osei Kwajo, Foreign policy was a matter of job security. A single defeat on the battlefield could see him dethroned in a humiliating fashion, just like Obodom. So, he treaded lightly. Just because Kwajo's foreign policy was cautious, though, don't think of it as passive, because it was anything but. No, Kwajo was an active foreign policymaker, but merely one who used soft power, the power of persuasion, to supplement the power of threats. And in 1765, a conflict would erupt in the southeast that would challenge the strength of Osei Kwajo's soft power strategy. Ever since the Ashanti had lost control over the Wasa, the country had struggled economically. The Wasa region had been of paramount strategic and economic importance to the Ashanti, as it had served as the only corridor through which Ashanti merchants could travel to the coast and trade with Europeans without being taxed, harassed, or sometimes simply turned around altogether by local peoples. The creation of a southern alliance threatened to make things worse for the Ashanti. The states of the south could, together, equal Ashanti military might, and could effectively mount a full blockade on Ashanti access to the coast. This certainly would have been an effective strategy, that is, if the coalition had stayed united. But disunity was their biggest weakness. The Ashanti had exploited this weakness in the past, but had never been able to quite break the devastating blockade of their coast. But, in 1765, Osei Kwajo formulated a plan to break the blockade once and for all. His plan, to make the keystone enemy in the Southern Alliance, the Fonti, into an ally. This would not only end the blockade, but also weaken the Southern Alliance, opening the door for future expansion into Wasa and Achim. But prying the Fonti out of their own alliance would be no easy task. While, yes, tensions existed between the Fonti and their allies, it's important to remember that their entire alliance hinged on mistrust of the Ashanti. And, with the Fonti especially, this mistrust was strong. The numerous governments of the Fonti Confederation had long assumed, correctly I might add, that the Ashanti had sought to conquer them during the rule of Apokuware, and that ever since then, the Ashanti were simply biding their time for a new opportunity to integrate the Fonti under their imperial fold. So, the first challenge that Osei Kwajo would face was getting the Fonti to allow Ashanti diplomats into their territory at all. The Fonti, of course, were quite aloof about the prospect of spies. So, to alleviate concerns about spying, Osei Kwajo came up with an unorthodox plan to get the Fonti to accept diplomats. He selected two of his most trusted relatives, his cousins Osei and Danso, and sent them to the Fonti not as diplomats, but as hostages. And, just to make a quick note, Osei was, and still is, an incredibly common Akan name. So just keep that in mind that Osei, the diplomatic hostage, was a different person from Osei Kwajo. Yes, these names are repetitive, and it will get a bit confusing, but please just bear with me here. Now, this plan was incredibly risky, to say the least. Sure, sending hostages to the Fonti could be taken as a gesture of goodwill, helping the Fonti see that the Ashanti were willing to negotiate. But, just as easily, it could be viewed as an overture of hostility. I mean, imagine that you are a Fonti king, and a bunch of Ashanti soldiers roll up into your territory to drop off a couple of old noble dudes. Those old dudes throw up their hands, beg that you take them as prisoners, and say that they want to negotiate better relations between you and the empire that has sought to conquer you since, like, forever. Pretty suspicious if you ask me. I'd think that these guys had spies written all over them. Apparently, upon receiving Osei and Danso, as well as a couple of their servants as hostages, the Fonti were divided on what exactly to do with them. The group were immediately imprisoned in the town of Abora, where the Fonti elites debated on what to do with their new prisoners. Many within the Fonti government thought that this overture of peace was an obvious trap, an attempt to lower the Fonti's guard against the Shanti incursion. Leading this faction was the de facto leader of the Fonti military, a young man named Quagil. Quagil had, until just before Osei and Danso's arrival, been a mere officer, a stupi, or a leader of a single company in the Fonti army. However, he had just recently achieved a promotion to Chwafo Hene, the commander-in-chief of the entire Fonti military. Quagil had something of a reputation as a hothead and warhawk, 
and did not trust Osei or Donso in the slightest. Unlike Quagil, though, some in the Fonti Confederation were willing to take Osei and Donso's peace offer seriously. Namely, the faction in favor of peace was headed by the King of Makesim, the most powerful Fonti king, as well as the other kings of the Confederation. Yes, you heard that right. Kings. Plural. Remember, during one of our early episodes, we talked about how the Fonti formed an unusual confederation government with multiple kings, a legislature, and a complex series of military companies. If you'd like to learn more about the unusual and fascinating government of the Fonti, our latest premium episode will focus on that topic exactly. To listen to this new episode, simply go to patreon.com slash historyofafrica and support the show. It really helps us a lot. And if you're already supporting us, thank you. Due to this internal disagreement within the Fonti government, peace negotiations between the Ashanti party of diplomats and the Fonti government would be slow. However, throughout 1765, slow but real progress was made. After almost a year of tense negotiations, Osei and Donso had convinced their captors to let them meet with the Fonti legislature, known as the Deputies of the Alliance. That year, the deputies met in Abora with the Ashanti hostages. A vote was held, and their decision was made. In exchange for perpetual alliance and peace with the Ashanti, the Fonti would end their blockade and allow free passage for Ashanti merchants. Things seemed to be going well. While Osei and Donso would remain as hostages, they had succeeded in their task. The southern alliance had been broken, and an alliance with the Ashanti had been secured, all through the power of diplomacy. The Fonti had, for a while now, been the strongest link in the southern alliance. So, when the Fonti Federation abandoned this alliance and joined the Ashanti, it was all over for the remaining members. Within a few weeks, a combined force of Ashanti and Fonti armies would invade and overwhelm the Achem. What little rebellious forces remained in Denchira territories were also put down, and much of the Waza territories to the west were seized as well. It was clear to everyone that Osei sought to reunite the lost territories in the south, and taking over the rest of Wasa was clearly his next ambition. However, things would not turn out to be so simple. While the 1765 wars against the Achem, Chuifo, and Wasa had been resounding successes for the Ashanti, they had provoked intense backlash and suspicion among their new Fonti allies. Remember, powerful factions in the military, as well as a minority of Fonti deputies, were already skeptical of the Ashanti's sincerity in their offers for peace and alliance, and the manner in which the Ashanti had conducted their wars had only inflamed these pre-existing tensions. For starters, despite participating on the Ashanti side, the Fonti received little to no land or treasure as compensation for their efforts. More importantly, the conclusion of these wars now meant that two enormous Ashanti armies, the ones that had been used to crush the Wasa and Achem respectively, were now just chilling right on the Fonti's borders. Most disturbingly, a particularly large portion of Ashanti soldiers were hanging around Abora, you know, the same place where the Ashanti diplomatic captives were held. To many Fonti, it seemed obvious what the Ashanti were planning. They would invade Fonti territory, liberate their hostages from Abora, freeing the last leverage that the Fonti held over them, and then move on to conquering the rest of the Confederation. Fearing imminent war, an emergency meeting of the Council of Deputies met with the kings of the Fonti. Joining them was a small cadre of representatives from the British Company of African Merchants, who, for a while now, had served as the Fonti's main European trading partner and ally. Alongside his British allies, Quagil and his supporters in the military requested that the Fonti kings order the mobilization of the army. With the Ashanti massing their forces near Abora, Quagil argued that war with their northern enemy was inevitable, but not unwinnable. Quagil and his Ashantis may come when they will, but we are braver and stronger, and we will prevail. Alongside Quagil, and supporting his argument for war with the Ashanti, was a man named Gilbert Petrie. Petrie was the colonial governor of Cape Coast Castle, one of the many coastal forts operated by the British Company of African Merchants. This charter company, which dealt in the trade of finished goods, cola nuts, and, most significantly, enslaved people, had recently acquired many old British ports in Fonti territory. As a result, the company maintained incredibly friendly relations with the Fonti government, as the two were enthusiastic economic allies. Like Quigil, and unlike most of the British merchants in the region, Petri himself was quite enthusiastic about the Fonti's prospects in a war against the Ashanti. I am of quite a different opinion in regard to the Ashanti's strength and bravery, neither of which I ever saw an instance of but in bravado, and the tyrannical exercise of their superiority over the lesser states. Now, in 1765, Petri's opinion was, frankly, not of much value to the Fontys. After all, the British Company of Merchants only controlled a handful of small stone castles on the coast, each garrisoned by a couple soldiers equipped with muskets no better than those wielded by any West African kingdom. They were an important trading partner, but nothing more. However, do keep in mind the presence of this charter company on the coast. 
As we know, they will become very important throughout the rest of our podcast. Anyways, Quagil, Petri, and their allies won the support of the Fonti kings and deputies, at least partially. The government provided Quagil the orders he had wished for. His army would mobilize along the Ashanti border and resume a blockade of anyone going in or out. However, the government wasn't willing to actively pursue war with the Ashanti. Quagil and his armies were not to step foot into Ashanti lands, and they were only to fire when fired upon. Quagil accepted these orders and began to mobilize his armies along the Ashanti border. So, now the Ashanti and Fonti armies, still ostensibly allied, are staring at each other from across their kingdom's borders. Seems like a recipe for a disaster, right? Well, things are actually about to get worse. Back in Abora, knowing that things between the two powers are going south, Osei decided that now would be a good time to let Osei Kwajo know exactly what was going on. Osei was still committed to peace, and wanted to ensure that all of his hard work over the last year wasn't wasted. Not to mention, he had his own self-preservation to worry about. If the Ashanti and Fonti went to war, well, we know what would probably happen to the Ashanti captives at Abora. So Osei, desperate to prevent war, told two of his attendants to leave Abora and return to Kumasi with a message. This message would inform Osei Kwajio on what was going on, and urged him to show restraint. He gave the messengers muskets and powder as well, just in case someone tried to bother them along their route back. The two attendants set out from Abora, and were almost immediately chased by the Fonti army massing on the border. One managed to escape across the border into Ashanti territory, but the other was caught. The Fonti assumed that they were weapon smugglers, and sent the captured messenger back to Abora, where he was executed. When the Ashanti government caught wind of what had happened, they were outraged that one of their citizens had been executed by Fonti soldiers for trying to deliver a message. The journey of these messengers, intended to support peace, had in the end caused tensions to heighten. Oops. However, back in Abora, Osei still held out hope for peace. He again sent out a message urging for restraint and desperately trying to downplay the situation. He argued that the man who had been executed was merely a slave, which was a lie by the way, and therefore his execution was no big deal. Besides the fact that it's a lie, I'm not even going to touch on the morality of that statement. But even with tensions at a fever pitch, Osei Kwajo did not want war with the Fonti. The execution of two esteemed noblemen by a foreign enemy, which would undoubtedly happen if the Fonti and Ashanti went to war, would be incredibly embarrassing for the Ashanti Hene. And remember, he was also not exactly a warhawk to begin with. Additionally, with war between the two states looming, the Fonti had put their past conflicts aside and resumed their alliance with Wasa. While Ashanti military leadership may have been confident that they could quickly defeat the Fonti alone, a two-front war with both the Fonti and the Wasa could prove more difficult. So, despite everything, the Ashanti army at the border stood down, and nobody fired a shot. War was averted, at least for the time being. With disaster narrowly avoided, Quajo's concerns shifted towards negotiating the release of Ose and Danso. Sure, they were safe for now, but he didn't want to risk putting them in danger next time there was a flare-up in relations between him and his enemies. However, this was no easy task either. The diplomatic tensions of the time meant that any direct negotiations between the Ashanti and Fonti would be, well, difficult. Remember, this whole scandal had started because the Ashanti sent diplomats to the Fonti in the first place, and look how well that turned out. So, for the next seven long years, each side stood at a near standstill. Occasionally, tensions would flare up even further, resulting in a small skirmish, but things always calmed down before an all-out war could begin. By 1772, it was clear to everyone in the Ashanti government that any attempt to negotiate directly with the Fonti for the release of their hostages would meet a dead end. If the Ashanti were going to negotiate, they would need to do so through an intermediary. And the perfect intermediary were the non-British Europeans on the coast. Now, the European merchants have mostly been absent from our series for a while. Since we last examined the status of European merchants on the Ghanaian coast, or Gold Coast as they called it, a few things have changed. For starters, of the six European countries to possess forts on the coast, only three of them remained. Whether through treaty negotiations, capture by enemy navies, or selling their possessions to competitors for healthy sums of gold, the Portuguese, Swedish, and Brandenburg Prussians were now all but completely absent from the coast of Ghana. The European presence on the coast had been reduced to the Dutch, British, and Danish. Now, each of these European countries had aligned themselves to the local ally. In the case of the British, this was the Fonti, and in the case of the Dutch and Danish, it was the Ga and Ashanti. And it was this relationship that the Ashanti would leverage in the coming hostage negotiation. While they shared the Danish and Dutch as mutual allies, this did not mean that the Ga and the Ashanti were necessarily friends. The Ga, of course, were not one state or kingdom. They were split between multiple city-states, each of which had their own beefs with the Ashanti or Fonti, respectively. 
The city-state of Accra, the most important and powerful Ga city-state, had stayed ostensibly neutral in the conflict between the Ashanti and the Southern Alliance. This neutrality persisted, despite the fact that, really since 1750, the Fonti had frequently sought to include Accra in their anti-Ashanti alliance. While the Ga had strong incentive to fear Ashanti expansion, they had equal reasons to fear the opposite. The Fonti, after all, posed just as big a threat to the Ga as the Ashanti did, and aligning openly with either side could provoke the other to attack. So, Accra fiercely clung to their neutrality. Earlier, in 1765, when Achim fell to Ashanti invasion, the king of Achim fled to Accra, seeking refuge. Despite being longtime trading partners and maintaining friendly relations with the Achim king, the council of nobility that ran Accra feared that allowing the Achim Hene, an enemy of the Ashanti, to seek refuge in their city would endanger their neutrality. So, they turned the king away, handing them over to the Fonti as a prisoner. However, as tensions between the Ashanti and Fonti continued to escalate, the prospect of Ga neutrality in the conflict became more and more unlikely. In 1772, Quegil tried once again what many other Fonti leaders had tried in the past, and attempted to force the Ga into an alliance with the Fonti. He mobilized many of his soldiers outside of several Ga towns near the Fonti's border, and once again requested that the Ga join the anti-Ashanti reliance. The implication that Quegil was sending was clear. Join us, or you are our enemy. Quegil's demand had mixed results. While some Ga cities, especially those along the border, took the threat to heart and aligned with the Fonti, this was not the case with Accra. This threat of posturing had done nothing but convince the elites of Accra that, actually, the Fonti posed a much greater threat to the Ga than the Ashanti did. The elders of Accra requested an Ashanti envoy in July of 1772, and soon they had negotiated several key points of alignment with the Ashanti. Ashanti soldiers and merchants would have free reign to move through Accra, and they would also obtain free access to nearby Dutch and Danish ports. Now, the Ashanti could finally interact with their European allies for the first time since 1750. And, of course, the Dutch and Danish disagreed strongly with the Fonti's attempted blockade of their main trading partner. In December, an Ashanti army marched to Accra, garrisoning the city against expected Fonti attack. Additionally, the general leading the army convinced the Danish and Dutch to economically aid the Ashanti in any coming war. Together, the Dutch and Danish African companies formulated an agreement with the Ashanti that, if the Fonti did not release the Ashanti prisoners as soon as possible, that they would materially support the Ashanti in any resulting war through the provision of arms and resources. This proclamation spooked the British, whose confidence in the ability of the Fonti to defend themselves was waning. Fearing that an Ashanti victory could threaten their own commercial interests, the British began to pressure the Fonti to release Osei and Danso. At first, the Fonti refused to give up their last piece of leverage in negotiations with the Ashanti. But when the British added that if they did not release Osei and Danso, that they would not support any upcoming wars with the Ashanti, the Fonti were reluctantly forced to agree. Osei was released from Abara, and he returned to Kumasi before the end of the year. Donso's fate, on the other hand, is not explicitly known. With Osei's release, the floodgates opened and war between the Fonti and Ashanti began. Despite all of the build-up, this particular conflict didn't amount to much. The Ashanti scored some impressive victories early on in their campaigns against Wasa, but were ultimately unable to conquer their western foe. Meanwhile, the Ashanti repelled Fonti attacks against Accra, but were later defeated themselves in a failed attempt to invade a Fonti-aligned Ga city. In 1776, a year where little else happened in the world, the war between the Fonti and the Ashanti ended in status quo antebellum, with little or no territory changing hands. So, what exactly are we supposed to make of the entire fiasco involving Osei Danso and the Fonti? Who came out on top? Well, personally, I'd lean towards that the Ashanti came out of this fiasco in a much stronger position than they started. Yes, Osei Kwaju did not ultimately completely fulfill his goal of reconquering Wasa and Shuifel, but he did achieve some important foreign policy goals for the Ashanti. For starters, he finally ended the two decades long embargo of the Ashanti from coastal trade, alleviating the depressing economic conditions within his own kingdom. Additionally, despite its convoluted and risky nature, Osei Kwaju's gambit with Osei and Danso did ultimately allow the Ashanti to recapture Achem and northern Wasa major territorial gains which themselves enabled the later reopening of coastal trade. So can we call this whole episode a success for Osei Kwajo? I'd say yes, but an incomplete one. Anyways, Osei Kwajo's life concluded shortly after the war with the Fonti. In 1777, Osei Kwajo breathed his last after occupying the Golden Stool for 13 years. And when you consider how relatively short this reign is, it's really impressive how much Osei Kwajo achieved.
Not only did he improve the national bureaucracy, but he also established a precedent of peaceful transitions of power after election to the throne. He also established a parliamentary system for the Amanhane and Nsafohane to resolve disputes through peaceful deliberation instead of civil war. This institution would prove invaluable in improving the stability of the Ashanti state. In terms of foreign policy, he was a man who understood that, sometimes, the pen could be mightier than the sword. Neither a pacifist nor a war hawk necessarily, Osequajo's foreign policy intelligently manipulated his enemies into isolation, then took advantage. His limited successes are impressive nonetheless, I think. I mean, he was able to re-establish access to the coast, a goal which had eluded his predecessor. Overall, when evaluating the effectiveness of a ruler, there are really two questions that are worth considering. Did the ruler leave their country in better shape than they found it? And how much can we credit the individual ruler, rather than wider trends or chance, for their country's circumstance when they leave power? When you compare the decrepit and humiliated empire he inherited, and the re-empowered, ascendant empire that existed at his death, I think the answer to the first question is a resounding yes, the empire was better off than at the start of his reign. And, due to Quajo's direct personal involvement in many of the institutional reforms and foreign policy decisions that define his reign, I think I can confidently say that Ose Quajo himself played a very important role in the Ashanti's success. This might make me sound a little biased, but personally, Ose Quajo is my favorite figure in Ashanti history, and the fact that so few people know about him is criminal. I hope you found learning about his life and rule as fascinating as I did. Despite his numerous institutional improvements, however, Osequajo's rule was far from the end of instability in the Ashanti Empire. In fact, in the aftermath of his death, things would regress quickly back into a chaotic state much like the one that had brought Quajo to power in the first place. Join us next episode, as the Ashanti Queen Mother battles with a 12-year-old boy and the richest man in the Empire for control over the Golden Stool. Thank you for listening to the History of Africa podcast. If you like the show and the free education we provide, then I'd encourage you to support the show. This can be done by a monetary donation to our Patreon, which can be found on our website, historyofafricapodcast.blogspot.com. By giving the show a review on iTunes, or by sharing the podcast to anyone who you think might be interested. This episode is brought to you by our supporters on Patreon, including Naomi Kanakia, Ayo Fagbamie, Kevin Johnson, Morgan Blackmore, Sean Burke, Sarah Mpenza, and Tobias Tungland, among others.